Lesson 11 The Christian and Work Sabbath Afternoon December 5 To Adam was given the work of caring for the garden. The Creator knew that Adam could not be happy without employment. The beauty of the garden delighted him, but this was not enough. He must have labor to call into exercise the wonderful organs of the body. Had happiness consisted in doing nothing, man, in his state of holy innocence, would have been left unemployed. But he who created man knew what would be for his happiness, and no sooner had he created him than he gave him his appointed work. The promise of future glory and the decree that man must toil for his daily bread came from the same throne. Angels delight in a home where God reigns supreme and the children are taught to reverence religion, the Bible, and their Creator. Such families can claim the promise, Them that honor me, I will honor. As from such a home the Father goes forth to his daily duties, it is with a spirit softened and subdued by converse with God. The Adventist Home, pages 27 and 28. Let us teach the little ones to help us while their hands are small and their strength is slight. Let us impress upon their minds the fact that labor is noble, that it was ordained to man of heaven, that it was enjoined upon Adam and Eden as an essential to the healthy development of mind and body. Let us teach them that innocent pleasure is never half so satisfying as when it follows active industry. Child Guidance, page 127. The life of Christ from his earliest years was a life of earnest activity. He lived not to please himself. He was the son of the infinite God, yet he worked at the carpenter's trade with his father Joseph. His trade was significant. He had come into the world as the character builder and as such, all his work was perfect. Into all his secular labor, he brought the same perfection as into the characters he was transforming by his divine power. He is our pattern. Parents should teach their children the value and right use of time. Teach them that to do something which will honor God and bless humanity is worth striving for. Even in their early years, they can be missionaries for God. Christ's Object Lessons, page 345. To all Christ has given the work of ministry. He is the King of glory, yet he declared, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. He is the majesty of heaven, yet he willingly consented to come to this earth to do the work laid upon him by his Father. He has ennobled labor, that he might set us an example of industry he worked with his hands at the carpenter's trade. From a very early age, he acted his part in sustaining the family. He realized that he was a part of the family firm and willingly bore his share of the burdens. My Life Today, page 168. Sunday, December 6. The Many Sides of Work. I have seen that those who live for a purpose, seeking to benefit and bless their fellow men and to honor and glorify their Redeemer, are the truly happy ones on the earth, while the man who is restless, discontented, and seeking this and testing that, hoping to find happiness, is always complaining of disappointment. He is always in want, never satisfied, because he lives for himself alone. Let it be your aim to do good, to act your part in life faithfully. This Day with God, page 280. The path of toil appointed to the dwellers on earth may be hard and wearisome, but it is honored by the footprints of the Redeemer, and He is safe who follows in this sacred way. By precept and example, Christ has dignified useful labor. From His earliest years, He lived a life of toil. The greater part of His earthly life was spent in patient work in the carpenter's shop at Nazareth. In the garb of a common laborer, the Lord of life trod the streets of the little town in which he lived, going to and returning from his humble toil. And ministering angels attended him as he walked side by side with peasants and laborers, unrecognized and unhonored. 
When he went forth to contribute to the support of the family by his daily toil, he possessed the same power as when, on the shores of Galilee, he fed five thousand hungry souls with five loaves and two fishes. But he did not employ his divine power to lessen his burdens or lighten his toil. He had taken upon himself the form of humanity, with all its attendant ills, and he did not flinch from its severest trials. He lived in a peasant's home. He was clothed with coarse garments. He mingled with the lowly. He toiled daily with patient hands. His example shows us that it is man's duty to be industrious and that labor is honorable. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, pages 276 and 277. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Psalm 73, verses 23 and 24. Before you engage in any important work, remember that Jesus is your counselor, and that it is your privilege to cast all your care upon him. Do not keep Jesus in the background and never mention his name, Never call the attention of your friends to him who is at your side to be your counselor. Would not your friends look upon you as disrespectful were they at your side and you never spoke to them or of them? Our High Calling, page 30. A religion which is not practical is not genuine. True conversion makes us strictly honest in our dealings with our fellow men. It makes us faithful in our everyday work. Every sincere follower of Christ will show that the religion of the Bible qualifies him to use his talents in the Master's service. Messages to Young People, page 72. Wednesday, December 7. Work and Nurture There were some who objected to Paul's toiling with his hands, declaring that it was inconsistent with the work of a gospel minister. Why should Paul, a minister of the highest rank, thus connect mechanical work with the preaching of the word? Was not the laborer worthy of his hire? Why should he spend in making tents time that to all appearance could be put to better account? But Paul did not regard as lost the time thus spent. As he worked with Aquila, he kept in touch with the great teacher, losing no opportunity of witnessing for the Savior and of helping those who needed help. His mind was ever reaching out for spiritual knowledge. He gave his fellow workers instruction in spiritual things, and he also set an example of industry and thoroughness. He was a quick, skillful worker, diligent in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Romans chapter 12 verse 11. As he worked at his trade, the apostle had access to a class of people that he could not otherwise have reached. He showed his associates that skill in the common arts is a gift from God who provides both the gift and the wisdom to use it aright. He taught that even in everyday toil, God is to be honored. His toil-hardened hands detracted nothing from the force of his pathetic appeals as a Christian minister. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 351 and 352. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. God desires the love that is expressed in heart service, in soul service, in the service of the physical powers. We are not to be dwarfed in any kind of service for God. Whatever he has lent us is to be used intelligently for him. The man who exercises his faculties will surely strengthen them, but he must seek to do his best. There is need of intelligence and educated ability to devise the best methods in farming, in building, and in every other department that the worker may not labor in vain. There is something to be learned every day as to how to improve in the manner of labor so as to get through the work and have time for something else. It is the duty of every worker not merely to give his strength, but his mind and intellect to that which he undertakes to do. Some who are engaged in domestic labor are always at work. It is not because they have so much to do, but they do not plan in such a way as to have time. You can choose to become stereotyped in a wrong course of action because you have not the determination to take yourselves in hand and to reform, 
or you may cultivate your powers to do the very best kind of service, and then you will find yourselves in demand anywhere and everywhere. Fundamentals of Christian Education, pages 315 and 316. Tuesday, December 8. Work and Excellence. To all who are engaged in his service, the Lord gives wisdom. The tabernacle to be born in the wilderness and the temple at Jerusalem were built in accordance with special directions from God. In the very beginning, he was particular as to the design and the accomplishment of his work. In this age of the world, he has given his people much light and instruction in regard to how his work is to be carried forward, on an elevated, refined, and nobling basis. And he is displeased with those who in their service do not carry out his design. He will separate such men from his cause and prove others who, if self-sufficient, will in turn be replaced by still other laborers. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 3, page 1129. Christ was a true worker in temporal as well as in spiritual things, and into all his work he brought a determination to do his Father's will. The things of heaven and earth are more closely connected and are more directly under the supervision of Christ than many realize. The one who in his earthly life worked as a carpenter in the village of Nazareth was the heavenly architect who marked out the plan for the sacred building where his name was to be honored. It was Christ who gave to the builders of the tabernacle wisdom to execute the most skillful and beautiful workmanship. He said, See, I have called by name Bezaliel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahisamech, of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded thee. Exodus chapter 31, verses 2 to 6. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 348 and 349. The Lord will give understanding to everyone who will fully connect with His work. We are not left to trust in human wisdom. In the Lord is wisdom, and it is our privilege to look to Him for counsel. We are all members of God's family, all in a greater or less degree entrusted with God-given talents for the use of which we are held responsible. Whether our talent be great or small, we are to use it in God's service, and we are to recognize the right of everyone else to use the gifts entrusted to them. Never should we disparage the smallest physical, intellectual, or spiritual capital. Some may trade in pennies and farthings, and by God's blessing and unwearied diligence, these humble ones may make successful investments and make a gain proportionate to the capital entrusted to them. No one should make light of any humble worker who is filling his place and is doing a work that someone must do, however small that work may seem. This Day with God, page 345. Wednesday, December 9. Work and Spirituality Indolent, careless habits indulged in secular work will be brought into the religious life and will unfit one to do any efficient service for God. Many who through diligent labor might have been a blessing to the world have been ruined through idleness. Lack of employment and of steadfast purpose opens the door to a thousand temptations. Evil companions and vicious habits deprave mind and soul, and the result is ruin for this life and for the life to come. Whatever the line of work in which we engage, the work of God teaches us to be not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Romans chapter 12 verse 11, Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10, and Colossians chapter 3 verse 24. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 345 and 346. Religion and business are not two separate things. They are one. Bible religion is to be interwoven with all we do or say. 
divine and human agencies are to combine in temporal as well as in spiritual achievements. They are to be united in all human pursuits, in mechanical and agricultural labors, in mercantile and scientific enterprises. There must be cooperation in everything embraced in Christian activity. God has proclaimed the principles on which alone this cooperation is possible. His glory must be the motive of all who are laborers together with Him. All our work is to be done from love to God and in accordance with His will. It is just as essential to do the will of God when erecting a building as when taking part in a religious service. And if the workers have brought the right principles into their own character making, then in the erection of every building they will grow in grace and knowledge. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 349 and 350. I speak to our people. If you draw close to Jesus and seek to adorn your profession by a well-ordered life and godly conversation, your feet will be kept from straying into forbidden paths. If you will only watch, continually watch unto prayer, if you will do everything as if you were in the immediate presence of God, you will be saved from yielding to temptation and may hope to be kept pure, spotless, and undefiled till the last. If you hold the beginning of your confidence firm unto the end, your ways will be established in God, and what grace has begun, glory will crown in the kingdom of our God. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. If Christ be within us, we shall crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 148. Thursday, December 10. Work and Stewardship. God desires that His workers in every line shall look to Him as the giver of all they possess. All right inventions and improvements have their source in Him who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. The skillful touch of the physician's hand, his power over nerve and muscle, his knowledge of the delicate organism of the body, is the wisdom of divine power to be used in behalf of the suffering. The skill with which the carpenter uses the hammer, the strength with which the blacksmith makes the anvil ring, comes from God. He has entrusted men with talents, and he expects them to look to him for counsel. Whatever we do, in whatever department of the work we are placed, He desires to control our minds that we may do perfect work. Christ's Object Lessons, page 349 Work is a blessing, not a curse. A spirit of indolence destroys godliness and grieves the Spirit of God. A stagnant pool is offensive, but a pure flowing stream spreads health and gladness over the land. Paul knew that those who neglect physical work soon become enfeebled. He desired to teach young ministers that by working with their hands, by bringing into exercise their muscles and sinews, they would become strong to endure the toils and privations that awaited them in the gospel field. And he realized that his own teachings would lack vitality and force if he did not keep all parts of the system properly exercised. The Acts of the Apostles, page 352. Paul urged his brethren to ask themselves what influence their words and deeds would have upon others and to do nothing, however innocent in itself, that would seem to sanction idolatry or offend the scruples of those who might be weak in the faith. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. The Apostle's words of warning to the Corinthian church are applicable to all time and are especially adapted to our day. By idolatry, he meant not only the worship of idols, but self-serving, love of ease, the gratification of appetite and passion. A mere profession of faith in Christ, a boastful knowledge of the truth, does not make a man a Christian. A religion that seeks only to gratify the eye, the ear, and the taste, or that sanctions self-indulgence, is not the religion of Christ. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 316 and 317. A great lesson is learned when we understand our relation to God and His relation to us. The words, 
Know ye not that ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price, should be hung in memory's hall, that we may ever recognize God's right to our talents, our property, our influence, our individual selves. We are to learn how to treat this gift of God in mind, in soul, in body, that as Christ's purchased possession, we may do him healthful, savory, pleasing service. Reflecting Christ, page 138. For further reading, The Faith I Live By, A Temple Built by Sacrifice, page 193, and Patriarchs and Prophets, The Temptation and Fall, pages 52 to 62.